beyond the outer limits of human adventure, beyond the barrier of human credibility. Nice to be in order. What orbits are most satellites in? There's a lot of room out there, and there are actually an infinite number of orbits that a satellite can be in when orbiting around Earth. But that doesn't mean all those infinite orbits are actually useful. There are actually surprisingly few orbits that are targeted for most satellites. This is because the primary purpose for almost all satellites primarily has to do with the surface of the Earth. Orbital motion is completely ignorant of Earth's rotation, but for satellites, Earth is all that matters. There are only a few orbits that take advantage of both the rotation of the Earth and orbital motion, so naturally these orbits are most targeted and getting kind of crowded. You can see just how crowded it is in space in general through this visualization. There are over 15,000 objects that we're currently tracking. This includes all active satellites, all dead satellites that are still orbiting, all rocket bodies that were used to get satellites into their targeted orbits, and all debris from the few satellite collisions that have happened over the years. Keep in mind that this visualization doesn't show the actual size of these objects, but they're actually several orders of magnitude smaller than the dots represented. So even though it does look very crowded, there's actually quite a bit of space left over. Now looking at just the active satellites, and ignoring all else, it suddenly looks much less crowded. There are only about 2,200 active satellites in orbit. But even just glancing at them, you can already see natural groupings start to arise. The first of these groupings I'll cover is the most valuable real estate in space. It's the ring of satellites farther out than anything else, and it's called geostationary orbit, or GEO. GEO is a very unique spot in Earth's orbit. It is an orbit that is exactly matched to Earth's rotation, so when a satellite is in geostationary orbit, it doesn't move in relation to the Earth's surface. So when I select one and speed up the simulator, you can see how Earth is rotating under the ring of the geostationary orbit. Let's look at the two-dimensional view of Earth with the satellite's orbital motion projected on it. This is typically referred to as the ground track of the satellite. In the ground track, you can see it's not moving at all. The red circle, or satellite's footprint, indicates what the satellite is able to view from its current position. In this case, since it's a geostationary satellite that's so far out, it can see almost the entire western hemisphere of the Earth. This is why this orbit is so valuable. It's the only place where you can put a satellite in orbit and keep it still, and it can access a wide swath of the Earth's surface. For instance, this satellite that we're showing right now is used to broadcast satellite radio to both North and South America. Now it's only still in relation to the Earth's surface, so it's still orbiting, but the orbital speed at that distance is exactly matched to the Earth's rotation. Geostationary satellites have to be on the equator, otherwise they'll still move north and south. You can see this with an old GOES weather satellite. Even though it's at the same orbital distance as GEO, it's not exactly on the equator. It makes a figure eight on the Earth's surface, and at the top and bottom of that figure eight, you can also see it covers more of the northern or more of the southern hemisphere, depending on what position of the figure eight it's in. All the orbits within that ring of geostationary satellites have an orbital velocity faster than the rotation of the Earth, so it's much harder to maximize their usefulness over certain parts of the Earth's surface. At a glance, you can tell that geostationary satellites are much farther away than low Earth orbit satellites. But that distance is actually much farther than you might even realize. It's actually 22,000 miles or 36,000 kilometers away from the Earth's surface. That distance is so significant, it actually takes light almost a quarter of a second to travel the round trip between the surface of the Earth to the satellite and back. This can naturally cause issues with the operations of many different satellites. So now let's move a bit closer to Earth. The next major group of satellites is in medium Earth orbit, or MEO. This is a relatively sparse region of space that is loosely defined as below geostationary orbit and above low Earth orbit. There are far fewer satellites in this regime than either GEO or LEO, but one group of satellites in MEO probably affects your life more than any other, GPS satellites. Not only are US GPS satellites in MEO, but also all the other major GPS constellations are in this region as well. This includes Galileo for the EU, Baidu for China, and GLONASS for Russia. Here you can see the US GPS constellation. The crisscrossing pattern of the orbits and having multiple satellites in each orbital plane allows them to completely blanket the Earth's surface in GPS coverage. 
medium Earth orbit ends up being the most optimal place to put GPS satellites. By being in medium Earth orbit, each of the GPS satellites can still see 38% of the Earth's surface at any one time, but they're still moving fast enough to provide complete coverage of the entire Earth's surface as they are moving through their orbit. Looking at their associated ground tracks, you can easily see that GPS is completely blanketing the Earth. When we look at the footprint of just one of the GPS satellites, you can see it's still quite large and covers a vast portion of the Earth's surface, but it's still much, much smaller than geostationary satellites. MEO does have very real trade-offs, though. The GPS constellations are lonely for a reason. Let's go down closer to the Earth to the next orbit, low Earth orbit. Of the 2200 satellites currently in orbit, about 1600 of them are all in low Earth orbit, or LEO. LEO is very close to the Earth's surface and is defined as all orbits that are lower than 2,000 kilometers. Naturally, because it's so close to the Earth's surface, it requires the lowest amount of energy to reach. For example, SpaceX's Falcon 9 rocket can lift over 8,000 kilograms to geostationary transfer orbit, which is the orbit that puts satellites on their way to geostationary orbit. But it can lift more than double that amount to low Earth orbit, or 22,900 kilograms. This is really the primary reason why most of the satellites are in LEO. It's the default choice. Essentially, unless your satellite has some pressing reason to be in a different orbital plane, it goes to LEO. Since LEO satellites are closest to the Earth, they also move the fastest, completing an orbit in only about 90 minutes. You can see that with the International Space Station, which is in low Earth orbit. 90 minutes is a lot faster than the 24 hours it takes for geostationary satellites. This also makes communication a lot harder, as you can see from the satellite's ground track. Since the satellite is so much closer to the Earth, its red circle is minuscule when compared to the geostationary satellites, and even when compared to the MEO satellites. Combined with the fact that they're orbiting so fast, they're actually only in view of any single point on the Earth's surface for about five to 10 minutes at a time. That means all communications with these satellites need to happen within that very short pass window. But it also means that they are able to view large portions of the Earth as they race around it very quickly. Within LEO, there are orbits that have additional value other than just being close to the Earth's surface. Sun Synchronous Orbit, or SSO, aligns the orbital motion of the satellite with the Sun. The Sun provides power for all satellites and provides illumination for satellites trying to image the Earth's surface. Syncing the orbit with the Sun means that the satellite will pass over the same location at the same time every day, which can be naturally useful, especially for imaging satellites. That predictability can also be used to predict the power generation of a satellite and really optimize its usefulness. Between them, LEO and GEO cover the vast majority of satellites, and MEO makes up the majority of the remaining ones. But there is still a class of orbits that can be useful for unique cases. This class is called highly elliptical orbits. These are orbits that are not circular, but rather pass very close to the Earth's surface on one side of the orbit and very far away on the other. There are a large number of these orbits that are used for very interesting reasons, but the one that I'm gonna to cover today is called Molnaya, and this is what it looks like. As you can see, this orbit passes very close to the Earth's surface in the southern hemisphere, but then is very far away in the northern hemisphere. Since satellites go faster when they are closer to the Earth's surface, this means that those satellites have vastly more time over the northern hemisphere. It allows these satellites to essentially stay over one location in the northern hemisphere for a very long time and then race around the southern hemisphere quickly to reduce the amount of uselessness it has. One reason this was used was to keep a satellite over the high latitudes of northern Russia, which would normally be out of view for geostationary satellites. This is just one example of how highly elliptical orbits can be more useful than their circular counterparts. There are numerous other orbits that I could cover that are useful for different reasons and in different ways, but the ones that I've covered today are the vast majority of the ones that are used by satellites currently in operation and currently orbiting our world.